If you haven't read it, let me disturb your digestion. I have to find my spectacles as well. This is the main passage. People know this passage. It takes up exactly one and a half pages. There was never the least attention paid to what was cut up for sausage. That would come all the way back from Europe. There would come all the way back from Europe old sausages that had been rejected in Europe. And they were moldy and white. And it would be dosed with borax and glycerin and dumped into the hoppers and made over again for home consumption. There would be meat that had tumbled out on the floor in the dirt and sawdust where the workers had trampled and spit uncounted billions of consumption germs. There would be meat stored in great piles and rooms, and the water from the leaky roofs would drip over it, and thousands of rats would race about on it. It was too dark in these storage places to see well, but a man could run his hand over the, small, the piles of meat and sweep off whole handfuls of rat dung. The rats were a nuisance, of course, and so the packers would put out poisoned bread they would die, and then the rats, the bread, the meat, will go in the hoppers together. This is no fairy story. This is no joke. The meat would be shoveled into the carts, and the man who did the shoveling would not trouble to lift out a rat, even if he saw it. There were things that went into the sausage, however, which in comparison with a poison rat was a tidbit. There was no place for men to wash their hands. Sorry, I lost my place. There were no place for men to wash their hands before they ate dinner, and so they made a practice of washing them in the water that was ladled onto the sausage. There were butt ends of smoked meat and scraps of corned beef and all the odds and ends and waste of the plant, and they would be dumped into old barrels in the cellar and left there. Now, under the system of rigid capitalist economy, there are certain jobs that it doesn't pay to do very often, one of those would be to get rid of those barrels in the basement. So every spring, they would do it. They'd take the barrels and they'd be full of dirt and rust and old nails and stale water and all the stench of abomination, and cartload after cartload of it would be taken upstairs and, of course, dumped into the hoppers with fresh meat and sent out because you would hate to waste that water because water costs money. They would take the most offensive meat and turn it into smoked sausage. Smoking takes time, of course, so therefore it's expensive, and therefore under capitalist economy, you just get the chemistry department to preserve it with borax and color it with gelatin to make it brown. All the sausage came out of the same bowl, but when they came to wrap it up, some they would stamp special. And for this, they could charge two cents more a pound. That's the main section. I talk in other sections about steerly beef. They used to take the cows and feed them, some of them, on whiskey malt. And that would make them fatten up. Of course, it would make them cover with abscesses and boils. And so when a man killed it, the steer would literally explode in this vile excrement that went all over them. They would just wash it off in the barrels of fresh water that went in to the hoppers. Well, this is what I described. But endlessly about the workers' condition and what happens, Theodore Roosevelt in 1906, the book is translated into 17 languages, goes around the world, makes me some money, which I started my socialist colony with in Princeton. The book does well, and Theodore Roosevelt gets 100 letters a day talking about telling him to take action on this situation. I, of course, go to Washington, D.C. to follow up and demand Theodore take action. We actually sat down several times and talked about it, but always with the same problem. He just wanted to inspect the meat. He cared what happened to the workers, but he wasn't willing to expend capital his capital, political capital, on helping the workers. He believed you could reform capitalism. My friends, reforming capitalism is like bringing morality to a tiger. 
you have a better chance of teaching vegetarianism to cannibals than you have trying to teach a banker ethics and social justice. Well, we argued. Finally, he sent a note to Warren, Fred Warren, and said, please, could you bring Upton back to you? I'd like to run the country for a little bit without his help. But at least we got the Meat Inspection Act. But I always felt like a failure in a way. But I keep crusading. I've continued to crusade to this time against banks or oil or whatever it might be, trying to save us from this capitalist devil. You know, I'm reminded of a story. People ask why, why I keep this crusade going endlessly, even though it has hurt me financially, personally, socially. Why did I run for governor of California twice, futilely, to try to change and end poverty in California? That was my campaign promise, to end poverty in California once and for all. That's my adopted state. Why do I keep doing it? Well, I'm reminded of the story of Queen Mary, who said that the loss of Calais to the French during one of their wars, that this loss of Calais, that if you opened her up and looked at her heart, you would see on the heart the word Calais in black letters, that it marked her. I don't know if anybody wishes to do it, but if you opened me up, you'd see on my heart social justice, because I believe it is what we have to have in this country. It was promised to us in the Declaration of Independence, and we've yet to receive it. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you.